great one, the superior the there, king. No, no, I'm not even Michael. Michael, there's no, there's no doubt about it. I've seen or heard of the Tiger King stuff. <laughs> I watched two episodes. That was about enough for me. God doesn't need the president to do what he wants. God doesn't need the Senate or the House. He's going to do what he wants to do. Cool, dude. Yes, sir. You doing all right today? Yeah, man. So everyone, this is um, actually we just really, I mean, we've known each other. That's right. But for intensive purposes, we've now moved from acquaintanceship to I'm calling this friendship. That's right. That's cool. right. This is my friend Lawson. Um, he's one of the pastors at a church in the town that I live in. Um, I think you're executive pastor, if that's accurate, that's right. at Five Point. And I'd love for you just to share a tidbit about you and your family. Yeah. So I've been at Five Point for 10 years. Um, hey, that's yeah, awesome. Yeah. A decade. Congratulations. That's right. Thank you. But I've been with the church since the beginning. Um, we actually, we moved down. My my wife is our pastor's daughter. So cool. that is my father-in-law. And we moved down the month that the church started. And that is a total God thing as well because we were up in seminary in Raleigh, North Carolina. And I got accepted into Clemson for another master's degree cool. and to teach there. And... The same month that we moved down is the same month that Five Point started back in 2004, which is kind of cool. Um, I, I'm over our finance and outreach now. I used to be the executive pastor over all the church, but it grew beyond me. Mm. And I was the lid to the church is what Sam Chan, Dr. Sam Chan, told me. He said, you are the funnel, Lawson. You've got to give up something. Wow. And I said, I, I gladly will. And uh, so that was about a year ago. And so we've transitioned some different leadership, and it's been great. That's really awesome. enjoyed it. Yeah. Tell me about your sports teams. Do you pull for anybody? Yeah, so I worked for Clemson University football for uh, six years. Wow, I was as a, what? I was the academic coach for the team. So I was in charge of all their eligibility. I had like 140 wow. tutors at my disposal, a 22,000 square foot facility, $2 million budget. Uh, and I was 26 years old when I started that. Wow. Me and another guy, and I had tennis as well and a few golfers. And so Clemson is just like... I got my master's degree there. My whole family went yeah. there. But I went to Furman originally to play basketball. No yeah. way. So I graduated I didn't know that. with a BA in history at Furman. I uh, wound up not playing basketball, became a student pastor uh, back in my hometown of Gaffney. So cool. Yeah, so so God used you know my athletic background for his good uh, later on. And it was really good. So, yeah, so that's kind of... Clemson is what I love. I love the Boston Red Sox. My dad uh, went to a spring training fantasy camp one year down wow. in Winter Haven, Florida, and I got a full Red Sox uniform at the age of seven. And That's cool. Yeah, pro sports I'm not huge on, and one reason why is because I'm a Redskins fan, and they're just the visible. Yeah. So <laughs> nothing to get excited over there. Um, yeah. So that's, that's awesome. That's, and I'm a huge golf fan. I'm a golf junkie. I wish I knew anything about golf. I don't. <laughs> I lean into Lewis Wiles for all yeah. that stuff. Yes, see, and Lewis and I see each other at the course. My oldest son plays tons of golf. He's 13. Cool, And so cool. Lewis and them always talk, yeah. If you could be an athlete, book character, or movie character, who would you be? Oh, man. i tell you what. I think, so I was going to say Tim Tebow. Nice. Because he's got such a great platform for Christ. But then the other one was going to be Rory McIlroy. Who, he does so much for humanity. I don't know about That's his cool. his uh, his relationship with Jesus, but and he is such an incredible golfer. So both of them have giant platforms um, that just get to make a huge impact. When you get a day off from work, which I don't know how off, like frequent that is, but when you do get a day off, what is it you're doing? Normally something with my boys, uh, 13 and 11. Normally golf. Or yard work, or throwing something with my eleventh year old. I'm hey. telling you, my, my right shoulder is about done. He's wearing me out. That's awesome. Yes. Have you been keeping up with um, the Last Dance documentary? So we've watched two of them, Grayson and I have. I have to be kind of careful with it. I got to pre-watch it just to make sure everything's uh, sure. good. Um, but yeah, seeing Michael Jordan was like my oh, he was everything. Whenever I was growing up. In the conversation of. Who is the great one, the superior the there's, king? There's, no, no, I'm Where not even looking at Michael. Michael, there's no, there's no doubt about it. <laughs> not even in a defensive-themed conversation. Could LeBron contribute to anything defensively in comparison to Michael's defense? Here's the one thing I will say about LeBron is I do think 
passing wise, LeBron James is amazing. He is. Michael Jordan made his teammates so much better. Mm. Now, they might not have liked him very much, or, you know, it might, but he did make his team play better whenever he was on the court. Have you seen or heard of the Tiger King stuff? <laughs> I watched two episodes. That was about enough for me. It's crazy. <laughs> it's nuts. Yeah, I, I think sometimes people love watching these things because it's such a train wreck and they yes. can't imagine how anybody can get to that point. Yes. The show orders. I don't understand what's wrong with me, but I can watch four or five episodes in a row and my wife is ready to pack up and get into a hotel room for the weekend because I'm driving her nuts. So it's so funny. So my son, my 11 year old said, hey mom and dad, let's watch this show. It looks interesting. So we were down, we, we kind of got away last weekend and went down to the beach for like two nights. Awesome. And it rained the entire time. So we were stuck in the hotel room, which that was kind of miserable. So Gray said, hey, let's watch Hoarders. So I watched about two Duh. episodes and I said, I am so depressed right now <laughs> that I do not, and I feel like things are crawling on. Yeah. So I said, I can't watch Ooh. any more of this. Yes. In all of history, who would you have dinner with for one hour? Man, Paul. And Come on, man. Yeah. So that's man. such a church seminary. No, no, no. So, so a lot of people, a lot of people would say Jesus. Yeah. Mine is Paul, and here's why. So okay. I went this past fall to Greece, Turkey, cool. and Rome, and did Paul's missionary journey. But there was only like four of us that went, so we got our own personalized. Like I mean, we could go wherever nice. we wanted. To. It was so nice. So, but it really sparked an interest in me because I'm a history guy. I have three degrees in history. That's awesome. And and I had never really come at it from biblical history it had always been reformation mm. history or medieval history i mean another one would be um um thomas aquinas i'd love hey, you know, that, wow that, that you know um maybe balthasar hubmeyer mm. you know different guys like that but paul is the one that set the foundation for them all it's good and i just can't get away from that so yeah. if i had one hour somebody would probably be paul that's awesome yeah give me your time management secrets yeah my staff would tell you that I'm horrible uh, with that but because I can't say no to anything but one of the things that that I try and do is make sure that I am keeping up with people that want information from me all right mm. so what I mean by that is this I I have so I'm on the, the board for the Chamber of Commerce I'm on the YMCA board I'm on you know different other outside the church things but within the church I also get the information emails I get all these questions that come into the church so a lot of my time is spent answering questions finding solutions for mm. things and so I always make sure that I carve out time each day even on the weekends to answer things so that I'm very I'm, I'm one who believes on being prompt with answers mm within 24 hours no less and so that's one thing that I always want to try and work on so that's my first time management um, but then starting the day off with something positive and so I get up and I read my Bible the very first thing because I feel like that is going to get my feet going on the ground in the right direction and I think whenever you start off the day with something positive like that and then some exercise, it gets you into the right frame of mind where you will start attacking things right away. Mm. And then you put some tasks down and you mark off those tasks and that is the best feeling in the world whenever mm. you can mark things off yeah, yeah, yeah. and have them done. Um, so then you start accomplishing things and that gets contagious. Who's someone that you would look up to in your field? Yeah, there's there's a few. Um, most definitely. There's a, there's a guy that I've just gotten to know that I really have a lot of respect for, and he's actually, he and I do some, he does some coaching for me. Um, his name's Danny Anderson. He's a pastor up of Emanuel Church in Indianapolis. Really big church, really awesome. But he just has a different perspective on things. Mm. He likes, he's a great delegator. Um, he thinks outside the box, and he has a really great demeanor of how to lead. And I think that's something through which I would like to learn a lot more. So that, that's one example um, that I would take. Our pastor, Pastor Dean, 
is somebody that I've been with him for 24 years. Um, just because my wife and I, we started dating whenever we were 15 years old. We were high school sweethearts. And he is one in which I really try and watch how he leads. He does great in one-on-one -on -one settings, mm. in some tough situations. Mm. And you know, a lot of leaders avoid conflict, whereas what I'm starting to see now is it, the more you avoid it, the worse that it gets. Mm. And we, you gotta face conflict head on yeah. in, a, in a loving fashion, and that's something through which uh, seeing him and then some other pastors, there's one J.R. Lee out in Ackworth, Georgia. He's at Freedom Church. He does an incredible job of just leading with tons of enthusiasm, uh, with a very good business mind. Um, because here's the thing, people say, well, church isn't a business. I, it, it is in a lot of mm. ways because you have to be able to fund the vision. You have to be able to have the people, uh, or as some, some churches, which I don't like it, they call it human capital. You have to have mm. human capital to be able to fund not financially, but physically, what the church has been called to do. Right, right. And so he does a great job of that. Of the mentors you've had in your life, give me one or two of the biggest lessons that you've learned. My high school basketball coach, I had him for one year, and the one thing that he said to me was, Lawson, what you put into it, the effort mentally, physically, spiritually, emotionally, is what you're going to get out of it. He said, now that doesn't mean that it's always going to be roses. He says, but you are going to feel accomplished whenever you have finished the task, even though it might not be successful. And I think that that that's spoken good. volumes to me because it makes it not outcome based; mm. it makes it effort based. Hey, that. tell me about the biggest obstacles that you've had to overcome in the, in those ten years of ministry, whether that's been personally or professionally. Uh, yeah, I, it's a mixture of both. I think personally, it was understanding my role. Um, and how God can use me in that role. I think sometimes you put your expectations in front of what God's expectations are. Mm -hmm. And so you go through a, a, a pruning process, and God definitely pruned me and continues to prune me, I will say that, because I am one that likes to think and kind of jump forward instead of understanding what God's doing in the moment. I'm right, like, okay, what's next? Right. What's next? All right. So in saying that, I think personally, he's had to really slow my, my heart and my mind down so that I will just understand completely what he's trying to tell me. Mm -hmm. Professionally, in church, I would say that um, I think one of the hardest things for me is I am someone who loves finding joy in people. I really do. Mm -hmm. And so whenever I have to hold people accountable in a tough way, it hurt, it grieves me a lot. Yeah. And it's not that I won't do it, it's that it just hurts. And I am very empathetic with people. Mm. And I counsel and I do do those types of things. And it just, it weighs on me. Right, right. It really does. And I think that's one of the things that I always have to be very careful um, is not to get one way or the other, but try and keep myself balanced. Yeah. Uh, that jumps really well into my next question, which this could be the same answer. You might have something different. Mm -hmm. But what, Lawson, about your job is way more difficult than everyone else would think or assume? <laughs> I had a letter on my desk this morning, just somebody saying thank you, Pastor Lawson, for carrying the weight and keeping us connected during the coronavirus and everything else that's going on. And I think, I think that a lot of times people don't understand exactly what pastors go through. I don't understand what a senior pastor goes through. So I can't imagine that with what I go through as an executive pastor and the spiritual battles that, that you go through, the sleepless nights that you have, the stress that you try to not be over or under and give over to Christ. But you know, it's just constant. Yeah. I mean, yeah, you know, yeah. we were on vacation, but I, I had you know call after call after call while I was down there. And, and you know, the, it's needs. Yeah. And yes, my family needs me as well, but I can, you try and balance that. And I think that is the hardest part is just understanding that, yes, I, I signed up for ministry. God called me to ministry and it is 24 seven. You don't, you don't have any technically off times, mm -hmm. but also you do have to be able to shut it down too. Right. Um, but I have a, I have a real hard time doing that with my mind. And 
and I know our pastor does too, mm -hmm. of just shutting it down and not thinking about it, not thinking about, okay, what's the next step in the process? What's the, what's the next thing that we can do to reach more people for Christ or to impact somebody for Christ or to help out someone? Or, um, so yeah, I, it's, it's a little different, but uh, from that answer, but I, I just, I think it wears on you because you just never get away from it. Yeah. But you don't want to get away from it. Mm -hmm. Because if you've been called to do it, man, that is something that I just love doing. If I go into a restaurant and I see people, I'm going over and talking to them. It's good. My staff has nicknamed me May Clay. Mayor Clary is what they say. Wow. Because I go anywhere and I will talk to anybody. <laughs> the I mayor. Love I love that. That's great. What would you like to see church people do less and what would you like to see church people do more? Okay. Mm, that's good. Um, so I think what I would love for church people to do less, I think, would be to come with expectations of what they want the church to do for them. Mm. On the flip side of it, I would want them to do more of what can they do to help take the church outside the walls of the church. Mm. And so really it is a changing of selfishness to a selflessness in the process. And understanding that as a as a part of the church at five point we say the members are the ministers mm. that you literally are a minister we, we have 18 staff mm. and we have tons of people come how in the world can 18 people minister to the people in the church I, I mean forget about outside the walls of the church so but we need to do all of it right so in right. saying that you know what the members have to be the ministers as well. I can't be at the hospital 24-7. That's right. I can't be at everything. And so we have people on on our legacy teams that they're nurses. Hey, guess what? You're going to be an extension of Five Point whenever you go into that room and minister to that person. And you're going to explain to them, hey, listen, uh, one of the pastors is praying for you right now, but I am here representing Five Point for you right now. We love and care for you. And that is so powerful. Mm. And it disciples that person to grow and be a minister of Christ. Mm. What do you think the church's role is in politics, if any role at all? I, I, <laughs> so my dad is in politics. He's a House member in the South Carolina House. And we talk about this a lot. You know, one of the things I think that you can do is if you will just teach what God's Word says, then people will be able to be obedient to what God is calling them to do in the world. Because, listen, God doesn't need the president to do what he wants. God doesn't need the Senate or the House. He's going to do what he wants to do. But, in saying that, we also need to take part in the process of it. As as church, are we bringing in presidents to talk or people on the campaign? Probably not right but I will say that we will teach what the Bible tells us to teach in regards to what is going to take place in our country. So, you know, we see that, I mean, Jeremiah was told that, man, he was known in the womb. God, God, God knew him before he was even born. Yeah. So we know that, that God knows all those babies that are being aborted. That, that's wrong. Mm -hmm. So we understand that, and so we're going to teach that. We're going to teach the biblical principles that we have, but also we understand that we are under governing authorities as well. And so, no, we're never going to endorse anybody from the stage. We're not going to do those types of things, but we're going to teach people, and we're going to tell them, go vote. Yeah, Go right, practice right, your right. right to vote because you don't have a say if you don't vote. Mm -hmm. All right? You're just you're, you're adding to the issue of you don't vote. But go and, and, and you know practice your right to vote because we are blessed to be able to live in the country that we live in. Speak on your thoughts on pastors' mental health and wellness. Yeah, I, I think pastoral mental health is probably the worst it's ever been right now. Um, because I just don't think pastors take care of themselves in a lot of ways. It, and the churches don't recognize what the pastors are going through. A great example of that is what took place with them. Uh, Pastor Patrick down down in Charleston. I just my heart hurts for him and his family. And I'm not saying Seacoast probably did everything that they possibly Absolutely, could in that sure. situation. But in a lot of other situations, 
I just see pastors just getting piled on. Mm. But then they don't say anything mm. because they just think that this is just the way that it is. Mm. Well, it's not. So one of the things that we try and do that we want to make sure is that we're being physically active because uh, exercise is shown to relieve stress. So we want to make sure that our staff is being physically active. We want to be able to talk if we've got issues, if we've got mental issues that we're dealing with stress or just anxiety or things happening in the home. I mean, you got to have an outlet to talk about that. Um, and a lot of pastors are on staff that they don't have staff. So who do they talk to about that? Right. You know, and that's what's so difficult about it. Now, is that the end-all answer? No, because, I mean, this has happened for years, but it just seems like it's getting more rampant right now and it breaks my heart because I know that these pastors uh, are, are hurting and they don't feel like they have anybody that they can talk to so mental health is something that's huge my mom was a psychiatric nurse she taught psychiatric nursing for 29 years and uh, at, at the college level and it just whenever you hear her talk of, of mental illness and those types of things it is so real mm. and uh, and so it just it hurts my heart whenever you do see these things because the outside world looks at it as an issue within the church. Mm -hmm. Pastors look at it as, if I tell anybody, I'm looked at as weak. Right, that's right. That's when, right. in essence, when you do speak up about it and you say something and try and get help, you're stronger than anybody else mm -hmm. because you're willing to be vulnerable. What do you think the church is going to look like in the next two to three decades farther down the road? What's the future forecast? of the American church. Yeah, I've thought about this a little bit. Not much, but a little bit. And I think there's two two paths. Um, and honestly, it depends on which way our country, the direction our country goes as well. From a political? Um, yeah, I think from a political standpoint. I think that it could be to where the government does start imposing some things upon the church and that would make it smaller or it would make it, it could make it larger, but you wouldn't have any freedom in the way that you worshiped. Um, or if, if it makes it smaller, it will make a more devoted group within that. Um, also, I think that this coronavirus crisis has maybe changed the way in which some people view church as well as uh, maybe being in the house of God isn't as important as just watching it. And I'm, you know, that's one thing that I've been wrestling with as well. And I want to encourage people that there's so much more to fellowship in the body of Christ than being isolated. Right. And that's one of the things that whenever this relents, as we start getting back into, into church, I think that is so important for us to understand the body of Christ, the family that is there, and the support that is necessary for mental health, for our spiritual well-being. Yeah. There's so many great things that take place with the body of Christ coming together um, in churches all across the world. So in saying that, you know, I think they're still going to be traditional. They're still going to be contemporary. There's going to be new different types of worship that's going to be out there. But I also think that there will be also a push for a lot of smaller type of micro churches as well yeah. throughout the world. Um, because I, I wonder how sustainable it's going to be to have large, you know, these mm. just gigantic, you know, 5,000 seat auditoriums, right. different things like that. Right. So, yeah. What is it you want to be remembered for? Yeah, I, I think I'd love to be remembered for the way in which I depict Christ in my life. The way in which um, I allowed him to impact others through me. And for the care that I have with people. I mean, I, my prayer is that people understand I genuinely love them. Uh, if people come through the door, and I, I try and learn everybody's names that come through the door at five point, I try to, and I holler out your name, it is because I genuinely want to know what's going on in your life. Right. And that's something that that's that's something that God has laid on my heart. It's not for everyone, mm -hmm. because with that comes a lot of uh, a lot of heaviness mm -hmm. that people have going on. I didn't realize it whenever I started how just heavy some people's lives are. And I mean that in a in a in a good way though, because they're trying to work through things. They're trying to allow God to work through it. But the mess that sin has created in their life, That's right. man, it is so sin just entangles so much. Mm -hmm. And so my prayer is that I will be one in which helps people through that. Um, 
a listener. That's good. Thanks for doing this interview with me, yeah, man. I appreciate Thank it. Thank you for having me.